Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm Tim McDonald. I'm a nuclear policy analyst in CNA's strategy and policy analysis program. And this is the ninth virtual event in the CNA strategy and policy analysis program series showcasing our work. Uh, video of this event is going to be posted online at cna.org slash strategy, along with all the other past event videos. Um, so you can check that out soon at your leisure. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay. Great, thank you. Um, so we are today joined for this event on the future of arms control and on-site inspection by two outstanding and knowledgeable speakers. Corey Hinderstein is the Vice President of the International Fuel Cycle Strategies at the Nuclear Threat Initiative. This is currently uh, her second stint at NTI. From 2014 to 2017, she took a leave of absence to join the U.S. government, uh, where she worked in the NNSA as Senior Coordinator for Nuclear Security and Nonproliferation Policy. In that role, she led DOE's Iran Task Force, as well as the department's preparations for the 2016 Nuclear Security Summit. In addition to her government service and her work at NTI, Hinderstein has researched and published widely on such topics as proliferation, arms control, verification, and related topics. We're also joined by Pranay Badi. Pranay is a fellow in the Nuclear Policy Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, Pranay came to Carnegie from the State Department, where he worked on the New START Bilateral Consultative Commission, U.S. Strategy for the INF Treaty, the 2017 Strate Strategic Stability Talks with Russia. Pranay is a lawyer by training, and his research at Carnegie focuses on arms control, the role of Congress in arms control policy, and most recently, U.S. nuclear posture. Corey, Pranay, thank you both so much for being here today. So, we're gathered together, and a good-sized group of us, about 60-odd people for what is frankly a, a sort of wonky topic, um, at a very interesting inflection point in U.S. nuclear policy. In one of its first major foreign policy acts, the incoming Biden administration decided to extend the New START Treaty for another five years with Russia. It's also very likely that this new administration, just like all of its post-Cold War predecessors, will conduct a nuclear posture review. So right now and kind of on the horizon, there's a lot of nuclear policy action going on. And that's important and we need to keep an eye on it. That's not really what we're here to talk about today. What I'm hoping that we can do with today's discussion is to take a somewhat longer range view and start a conversation about what's just over the horizon in the field of arms control and on-site inspection. And by way of background, at least four facts are, are salient to that discussion, important to keep in mind. First is that the, the downward trend in the size of the US as well as the Russian nuclear arsenal since the end of the Cold War has been facilitated in part by inspection verified arms control treaties. That's not to say that the inspection verified treaties did all the work. We may have made unilateral cuts, for example, made other choices, but they were part of this, the, the whole process of this arms drawdown. Second, all of the US Soviet or US Russian arms control treaties, the nuclear arms control treaties that involve on site inspection, have taken place when great power competition was either waning at the end of the Cold War or absent for most of the, the rest of the post Cold War period. We have not yet concluded an inspection verified treaty while competing intensively with the Russians. It's not to say that we can't, it's just not something we've done yet. Third, outside of, but, but related to these formal arms control issues, technology has been evolving in a lot of different ways. On the one hand, there are new possibilities for inspection and verification that are emerging. This is something that I know for in particular is an expert on. Likewise, we have a host of strategically relevant nuclear as well as non-nuclear capabilities that are being developed by the major powers on an ongoing and continuous basis. Fourth and finally, the New START Treaty is going to expire. It was going to expire February 5th, now it's going to expire in five years. And what, if anything, comes afterwards remains unclear. It may be nothing. In that case, a, a good report by one of my, my CNA predecessors, Vince Manzo, on the future of arms control without a treaty may be relevant. But if we do have a treaty, or at least if we pursue a treaty, some of the things that we talk about today 
are going to want to be on policymakers radars. And so that's the, the big picture background that we're operating with today. And what I'm hoping we can do today is start a conversation that can knit together some, some you know, on the ground technical issues, as well as policy issues, as well as bigger picture strategy issues with a long range view to see what we can do for the future. Our discussion is going to run for one hour. I'm conscious of the time. I'm going to stop talking very shortly, I promise. But I wanna ask three basic batches of questions to get the ball rolling. And then we're gonna open it up to uh, Q&A from what I, I, I know from our RSVP list is an extremely knowledgeable and experienced audience. And we'll get to as many of, the, of your comments and questions as we possibly can. The three kind of batches of questions I wanna to touch on center on one, contemporary on-site inspection practice. Let's set a baseline for what on-site inspection is and isn't what it looks like. Two, the relationship between on-site inspection and arms control verification. What does on-site inspection get you? Third, possible roles that on-site inspection might play in some future arms control regime that shapes US as well as other countries' military postures. So against that background, we're going to get the ball rolling. Um, throughout this discussion, please, if you'll use the Q&A feature that you see in kind of the bottom of your screen to, um, to tee up your questions and comments, that's where we're going to be looking. Um, I'm going to be paying attention to that, as well as my, coll my colleague at CNA, Madison Estes, has um, generously offered to help me sort of quarterback those questions um, so I can do that more effectively. Um, with that, let us begin. Brene, I'm going to turn to you first, because I know based on your experience at the State Department, you've never been an arms control inspector, but you, you've worked on the Bilateral Consultative Commission. You've seen how they work. I know that you have taught an on-site inspection course or taught at an on-site inspection course. Can you kind of give us um, a, a baseline view of what on-site inspection is all about? Who becomes an on-site inspector? Where do these people come from? How are they trained? When they go on an inspection, what do they do? What tools can they use? That sort of thing. Yeah, thanks. Um, it, first, it's um, a pleasure to join you, uh, Tim and Corey and Madison. Uh, thanks for setting up this discussion. It's um, it's actually uh, a really good time to start thinking through these issues because um, even with a you know extended lease of life um, and the new START treaty, um, it can take five years to think about how we're going to use inspections again and how we're going to verify the next treaty with Russia or. Um, whoever we may conclude a, a new arms control treaty with. So uh, I think this is a really timely discussion. Um, you know, to, to touch on your question, um, it's important to note that inspection teams are multidisciplinary, just like the inspection mission is. Um, you know, back home here in Washington, inspections are supported by an interagency team when it comes to New START, uh, State Department, NSA, OSD policy, DITRA, joint staff, um, the intelligence community all play a role in supporting inspections. Um, you know, DITRA executes the inspection and escort missions. Um, they work closely with the agencies I mentioned to do so. The intelligence community ensures that there are intelligence resources available to support inspections. And obviously they have a, a larger remit when it comes to monitoring for an, an overall agreement. Um, and then NNSA brings really specific technical expertise and technologies um, to facilitate inspections, including hardware, uh, radiation detection equipment, for example. Um, you know, DITRA uses uh, the Defense Nuclear Weapons School and other entities to conduct inspector training. Um, um, you know, from my perspective, this includes a combination of, you know, classroom education, uh, uh, discussion, practical exercises, and of course, you know, OJT, on-the-job training. Um, you're paired up as a new inspector with people who are very senior and you make your way up to team chief for an inspection team and that's that's really part of learning um you know new start for example has at least two specific courses i'm aware of one is very introductory and one is more of a practical um you know i, I don't want to go on for too much longer but in terms of equipment um that are useful for inspections or brought to inspections um they're really specified by the agreement in question they can be mundane flashlights, calculators, uh, pencils, right? Measuring tape, string lines. Um, there are things that can be requested of the inspected party. So when a US team goes to Russia to inspect uh, an ICBM base, for example, um, they can request the use of a camera, uh, plumb bobs for measuring, uh, range poles, string lines, you name it. And then finally, there's the more technical equipment um, like uh, radiation detectors and counters 
uh, for the purposes of measuring radiation uh, emanating from a warhead. And then again, that's part of New START. Um, you know, I, I'd like to hear actually what Corey has to say on this question as well, but I'm of course happy to wax poetic further on inspections um, as, as we continue the conversation. Thanks, Brene. That's, that's useful, helpful background. Um, so if I can just push you a little bit further, when an, ins when an inspecting team, that's 10 people, right? A team of 10 inspectors goes to conduct an inspection. How do they decide what they're going to inspect? How do they decide where they're going to go? That's a great question. Um, and, and so inspection team sizes, escort team sizes can vary to differ um, depending on the, the kind of inspection in question. Um, in general, um, you know, inspections are tied to verifying the treaty. And as a result, uh, they need to be tied to uh, metrics, items of inspection, you know, the types of delivery systems or warheads that a treaty may, may cover in terms of uh, limits um, and timelines that are delineated by the negotiators when they conclude an agreement. And so that includes a number of sites that are relevant to the treaty. So in the case of New START, you know, the job has kind of gotten easier over the past 25 years as the number of nuclear weapons related bases has come down since the start days when there were, you know, dozens and dozens of these sites in the in Soviet Union and former Soviet Union. Um, now it's a much smaller number. And so in, there's no way to have the entirety of the nuclear weapons infrastructure of Russia inspected in any given calendar year or treaty year. The point of the inspection is to ensure that through sort of a spot checking 18 times a year, you're confirming that the data the Russians provide in their data exchanges um, is accurate. And so, you know, the, it, the treaty is designed to make it really difficult to play a shell game where you're like, you know, oh, actually I have 10 warheads on this ICBM and I'm declaring one and you're never gonna check it, right? Because there's an uncertainty with when an inspection team may arrive. Um, there's obviously a lag time towards trying to cover up any sort of a deception um, that the Russians may be trying to embark on. And so that's why the inspection teams um, and DITRA works very closely with the policy and intelligence communities to determine what sites to hit when, is there a new type of weapon system coming online and um, they'd like to go see it early in a treaty year so that you know by the time they come back around to that site they can watch the evolution of how a system was based whether it's been moved that sort of thing it's all about you know and these treaties last a while right new start last to 10 years is now going to last 15 years it's all about collecting as much information as possible over the life of the treaty in addition to verifying that the limits uh, which came into effect in 2018 under new start have continued to be abided by by the russians now, there are many different kinds, at least I'm remembering from, and you'd, know, you'd be more current on this, but I'm remembering from the INF Treaty. And if, if you haven't read this book on the INF Treaty, uh, History of the Onsite Inspection Agency, it's really one of the, the better resources on the nuts and bolts of onsite inspection by uh, a historian named Pat Harahan. Um, I'm remembering that in the INF Treaty, at least, there were multiple different kinds of inspections, and not all inspections are created equal. There are exhibitions, there's destruction inspections, there's uh, facility inspections, and they're all tied to, um, to validating declared data. Can you talk a little bit more about what these different kinds of inspections are and what each of them does? Sure. Then we'll move on to, to uh, some other issues. Yeah, sure. No, I think it's a great question. Um, and, you know, it's a, a common critique um, of the New Star Tree is that there aren't that many types of inspections. You know, New Star has type one and type two inspections. In reality, that's because from the INF and START treaty days, um, the, there was a specific type of inspection associated with each of these activities. So when you eliminated a system, there was a type of inspection to confirm that an elimination had taken place. You know, Let's say the treaty calls for an ICBM to cut into four pieces and then for rocket motors to be burned out um, a certain distance away. Etc. To verify that all those provisions have um, been followed, um, an inspection team has to go and make sure the cuts are in the right places, the rocket fuel is all gone, etc. Um, and that was a specific inspection type in INF and START. Under New START, those have all been consolidated into either Type One or Type Two inspections. Now, the way I like to think about this, um, to keep it simple for myself, Type One inspections tend to um, involve inspection activities at bases where there are deployed you know, active 
strategic nuclear weapon. So an ICBM, a submarine base, or an air base. Uh, type two inspections tend to deal with um, where you may have non-deployed forces, uh, test ranges. It's kind of the catch-all for everything except for deployed areas. And so the negotiators decided that was an easier way to break everything down. Um, you can conduct more inspection activities um, for more types of inspection activities over the course of a single inspection, rather than having to have separate inspections for conversions, eliminations, checking storage sites, test ranges, etc. cetera. Um, and you know, um, examples of those, um, as you mentioned, conversions and eliminations, they're also under INF and START, there were closeout inspections. Um, they have something similar under New START. When a base is basically done um, and, and not being used anymore, uh, inspection teams arrive to make sure, you know, all the doors are locked, all the silos have been filled with concrete, that sort of thing. Um, there are also exhibitions, which, um, you know, it's a different word than inspection, but it is really an inspection activity. It's really the first look at one of the treaty parties will get at a newly deployed weapon system. So, you know, for example, Russia deployed a new hyperspon hypersonic glide vehicle atop an ICBM called the Avangard. Um, they hosted an, an exhibition, which is required by the treaty when a new type um, of ballistic missile or other strategic delivery system is deployed. And so US inspectors were basically able to see this for the first time, um, confirm that the measurements that the Russians declared were in fact accurate, um, and again, get their kind of first snapshot of the system so that when they start to inspect ICBM bases where the system is deployed, they'll know what they're looking for. They'll know what the measurements were at the exhibition, they'll get to compare them to, to what they recorded in the photographs they took, that sort of thing. Um, hopefully that touches on your question without getting too far into the weeds. I don't know that we can possibly get too far into the weeds on this issue, but maybe, maybe I'm just sort of betraying my own interests. Um, but thank you, Pranay, that's, that's been extremely helpful. Um, I wanna move on to sort of the, the, next, the next basket of, of issues that we can discuss, which is the relationship between on-site inspection and treaty verification. And um, Corey, I, I very much welcome any thoughts you may have on any of the, the foregoing sort of nuts and bolts inspection issues, but also I want to, to sort of use what Pernay laid out for us as a foundation for thinking about the different choices that negotiators have when designing a treaty and what the different costs and trade-offs are. For example, we heard that in the INF treaty, you had five different kinds of inspections and there was some value there, but also some costs. Um, as compared with the, the, the New Star Treaty, where there are only two different kinds of inspections. There's also this important concept of the, the smallest treaty verifiable item and what that, the, the concrete implications of that are. Um, I, I, I can keep going on, but I think uh, you, you have enough foundation um, to talk to us about how we should think about the relationship between on-site inspection, verification, cost and trade-offs and treaty design. Thank you so much. Um, and and I would not hesitate to jump in if there were anything I could add to what Pranay was saying, but he certainly has the experience that I don't um, uh, in understanding really, as you described it, the nuts and bolts side. Um, really, my focus has been on, on concepts and policies around verification and on-site inspection is a huge part of that. Um, and when it comes to uh, the purpose of on-site inspection and the role that on-site inspection plays in verification, I think it's important to recognize two things. I mean, one is let's not equate the two. And I really um, commend you in, even in setting up this session, on-site inspection is not verification. Verification is not on-site inspection. OSI is a tool um, that needs to play into the whole verification approach to a treaty or to any other set of commitments. And it's an extremely important tool in my mind uh, when it comes to arms control. Um, but the, the relative importance of that tool has also gone up and down um, over time. And that sometimes has to do with, um, you know, it can be less important if the, if the rights and, and, um, and responsibilities and obligations of the on-site um, inspection teams vary. It can also be counterbalanced by other measures. I mean, we mentioned at the top that there's a broad community that supports verification. And as, for example, national technical means got more powerful, on-site inspection was perceived as less. And then, but it, but that weight has switched back and forth as, you know, there have been incidents of either blind spots or, um, or frankly, um, deception. Then you realize, okay, we really need that on-site, uh, you know, the, 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 colloquial boots on the ground um, in, in to really have confidence in a system. So I do think thinking about this as a whole is extremely important. 
Um, the other point I wanted to say is that um, is that the an inspection type is not the same as an inspection purpose. Um, and so here I want to distinguish between kind of a, a technical description of an inspection type that Pranay talked about, but also the, inspe the on-site inspection um, suite of activities can serve really many different purposes. And as we design a verification system, we need to think about all of those purposes and how they balance against each other and how they play. So for example, um, if you're going to rely a lot on, um, on national technical means, and in, in, um, in this case, I want to emphasize maybe overhead imagery, then on-site inspection um, for the purpose of tipping and queuing might be more important to say, here's an area where we might want to be paying more attention to. Um, there seem to be changes happening. There seems to be um, there seems to be a disruption, whatever that might be. Um, it can also validate and confirm. I mean, this is the most direct kind of function. Some the, a, a treaty party says they're doing something. You go on site and say yes, in fact they are. Or they say they're not doing something. You go on site and you say there's no evidence that they're doing that. So just that's it. It seems straightforward. Of course, it's never that straightforward. But this idea of confirming and validating. Um, there's also an extremely important deterrence role with on-site inspection. Um, it w there's a concept of what you hold at risk. Um, even with um, periodic or, or random um, inspect on-site inspection, the idea that any of the treaty um, obligations could be, um, could be uh, confirmed or, um, or inspected at any time means that everything is being held at risk. And how you design that um, system is really important because, as Pranay said very well, even in New Start, but but especially as we think about some of those over the horizon demands, and I know we'll get into that, Tim. Um, the there will be no possible way to inspect everything all the time. It's it's not possible now. It definitely won't be possible with some of the future visions for arms control. So holding everything at risk and then having that deterrence function um, is really important. Um, and then there's also an idea of mutuality or equity, because after all, we could demand everything of our treaty partners, but if we're not willing to subject ourselves to that, um, then that's probably not gonna fly. Um, so when you think about what do you put on the table in a negotiation, you also have to put, uh, you have to think about, can I accept that? Or what are the terms under which I can accept that? Or what are the boundaries around that I have to place around that on-site inspection activity? Um, and then finally, the, um, the idea that um, on-site inspection can play significantly into analysis of, um, of whole state um, activity um, and, and pattern of life at a, at a site or facility level as well. So, you know, as you're there, are you meeting with the same people every time or is there, has there been an influx of new personnel? Um, are you seeing construction at a site that um, you're not really sure what the function is? These are all things that you can, you know, it's not the, per, it's not the inspection type but it's all things that play into that overall verification task. And that verification task is both very specific as it's laid out in a treaty, as well as your overall assessment at the state level. Do I have confidence that my treaty partner is doing what they say that they're gonna do? You know, sometimes I, I would never wanna say that's a gut instinct because we're gonna, we need data and, pra and, um, and practical um, details if you would ever um, assume that they're not, but you, but it does play into your overall confidence. Um, and frankly, that plays into the environment in which the treaty is being implemented. Thank you for that, Corey. That's, you, you put a whole lot on the table and I, I um, frankly don't uh, have the time that I wish I had to engage on all of it. But there's, there's, um, there's one thing, there's two things I wanted to highlight. I really like this distinction between inspection type and inspection purpose. That, that sounds like a, a good practical important distinction to make conceptually. Um, the other thing I wanted to flag is that, um, you know, my, my, my training in this space, uh, to the extent that I have any, is, is, is very much, um, you know, from, from Brother Tom and Brother Morton. Um, and one of the things they talk about is that arms control is, is very much an extension of or a part and parcel of your military policy because it helps you make choices about um, own and adversary. It helps you make choices about your own posture and shape your adversary's posture just as you can by buying more or less of different kinds of systems. And against that background, it really struck me the vocabulary that you use to describe um, verification in general and inspection in particular. You talked about deterrence against cheating through inspections, 
and he talked about designing an inspection regime or a verification regime overall that through um, almost like a you can conceptualize it like a combined arms approach to verification where you've got you know overhead you've got various different ntm and you've got boots on the ground that can hold at risk different facilities or different capabilities make sure that the adversary is not cheating um and i think that's the the fact that you use that same vocabulary from the military side in the arms control space is extremely telling um i guess the 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 thing i wanted to um to ask about is, and this is this is both a, a Corey and a Pernay question, um, because it, it, it's both conceptual as well as um, as practical. And I know you both play in both of those spaces. the The standard statement is the standard assertion is that on site inspection increases confidence that we can verify a treaty. Okay, so far as it goes, but I, I wonder in I wonder whether that's true in two spaces, or whether that's always true in two spaces. On the one hand, on-site inspection serves the function of making it so that you can verify things with smaller signatures. Maybe they're smaller in size, maybe they move around less or, 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 and are less observable, maybe they don't emit. So to a certain extent, if you're choosing to do on-site inspection, it means that you may have a more demanding treaty to verify. And at the same time, in particular, you know, queuing off um, some of what you talked about, Corey, about sort of the the background information that you absorb during an inspection. Um, one of the, the early concerns about on-site inspection, this is going back to the strategy and arms control from 1960-61, was that there was this possibility that getting more information about what's going on with your adversary could lead you to falsely suspect that they are cheating when in fact they are not. And sometimes maybe having a little bit less access, a little bit less behind the curtain could um, in, increase confidence that there's no cheating taking place um, or could could protect you from from false suspicions. So I wanted to tee that up for for both of you to to engage on before we start looking ahead from this sort of um, you know treaty design to possibilities for the future. Yeah, I mean, I'll jump in a little bit, but um, obviously interested in what Pernay has to say on these two points. I mean, I think that both both of the um, of the points that you make, both on the re the relationship between smaller or less um, less observable um, items of account um, and on site inspection, as well as the idea that more information could lead to less certainty. I think both of those are concepts that unfortunately lead us in directions of um, you know having to be cautious of self-delusion when it comes to designing inspection. I mean, um, and, and here I want to put a plug in for, for an ongoing project. Um, it won't surprise you, but the International Partnership on Nuclear Disarmament Verification is something that, that NTI and, and I personally am actively engaged in, which we um, co-lead with the, with the State Department. Um, and, uh, and, and it's really been important in, the, that, in that context to focus on what what it is that we're trying to do when we think about, in this case, it's disarmament verification, but, but you know, we, we're not talking about disarmament at zero exclusively in this partnership. We're talking about the entire process, which actually does have a lot of arms control, um, you know, uh, relation, um, it, especially as we think about those smaller items. So if we're really thinking that future arms control is going to have warheads themselves as treaty limited items, um, that's very different than delivery vehicles. And, um, and it brings in this idea of smaller size, um, different signature, but also more need to protect sensitive information. So you're going to need to, you know, to do your activities in a way that give confidence um, in a way that doesn't reveal sensitive or proliferative information. That has to be a central um, tenant to any on-site inspection activity. And I know that this is something that is that had been grappled with in um, in in Start Two and New Start um, actively, and there are many measures in place to protect that information. So, I do think that we have to be very careful in thinking about about these smaller items. That they're still, no matter how small or how large the item is, there's always going to have to be some sort of managed access or other sorts of um, shielding and shrouding and and other sorts of activities to protect that information. It doesn't matter how many people you put on the ground. Um, certain things are still not going to be visible, even if you're right in front of it. Um, and then the idea about more more inspection to less certainty, there actually is a technical analog to this, and that is in measurement. I mean, and when you get into measurement technology, 
the more you, you know, when you measure something and you have a certain amount of uncertainty related to that measurement, and I won't go science wonky um, here either, but, you know, you have a certain amount of, of uncertainty related to a measurement. The more times you do that measurement, the uncertainty doesn't stay the same. It actually, um, it amplifies. So you end up, the more measurements you take, you actually can end up, if it's not a very confident measurement, you can end up with a lot less confidence in your overall um, conclusion. And I don't mean that is just measuring the same thing over and over, but you do something at step one, something at step two, something at step three, something at step four. And by the time you get to step five, you've actually lost confidence in the entire thing as a whole. So there is kind of a technical basis for this. Um, but that being said, I think you do have to put a lot of, um, of a burden, um, an obligation, a responsibility on that on the analytical piece. You have to be able to say, we have all this information and it's leading us in a certain direction. And do we have confidence in the direction that that's, uh, that that's leading us? So taking the human element out of it, I think does lean in, Tim, to the, uh, to the challenge that you note. But I, have, um, I, I think there's a lot that we can do uh, with, the, with the human element, with training, with analytical techniques, um, with rigor. Um, and, um, and with this multidisciplinary, multi-point kind of assessment that, that in the end, I think it has to be part of any verification process. Okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I'm sure that um, everyone can have, everyone, your, your point about the, the challenges of measurement and the uncertainty that comes with repeated measurements uh, certainly resonates for me. I, I recently had to measure for an air conditioning unit and I was not sure at all what size this was by the, the end of the exercise. Um, so this is uh, something that's very intuitive and relatable. Um, so thank you for, for putting it in those, those helpful terms. Um, Pranay, get away in. Just very briefly, um, you know, sure. your second point you mentioned um, how the concerns with, you know, CI, if you will, um, CI concerns may increase as uh, inspections CI, become. Can you expand the acronym, please? By uh, counterintelligence concerns by an inspected party may increase as um, in a future regime where maybe inspections become more intrusive, uh, items of inspection become smaller, harder to detect by NTM, et cetera. Um, I think it's a good point. Um, you know, the, and, and Corey covered, I think, the great technical um, um, factoids on how we can address that moving forward. And without sort of jumping ahead too much into our next topic, um, mm -hmm. this is where this is where dialogue is really important, um, both on the ground among inspector, inspectors and escorts, as well as uh, diplomats who meet to discuss agreement implementation or treaty implementation in the case of New START, you know, twice a year in the non-COVID um, environment. Um, Inspections, you know, produce inspection reports. Um, differences of opinion or differences of facts in some cases are recorded in a piece of paper, documentation that both parties sign and will provide to the diplomats. The diplomats being technical experts and including technical experts from the interagency as well, will then be able to hash out differences they may have detected during an inspection. And it always starts with asking a question and raising it for discussion. And sometimes these inspection issues can take months to resolve because the two sides don't agree that, you know, that door was four feet wide and the treaty says, if it's four feet wide, I'm allowed to walk through it. Um, but they ultimately get resolved in a pragmatic way. And so um, to sort of, you know, raise the discussion up above inspections, I mean, as inspections are so inherently tied to uh, fulfilling treaty objectives when it comes to verification and monitoring and treaties inherently are designed to fulfill deterrence and foreign policy objectives by design. Um, a big piece of this is going to be that continuing negotiation that takes place throughout the life of an agreement. Okay, thanks for that. And that, that, that actually is a, um, unsurprisingly, uh, an excellent segue from, from both of you. Thank you uh, for the alley-oop. Uh, to our, our the last sort of batch of questions that I want to, to turn to, um, probably briefly, because we have a, a number of questions streaming into the Q&A, and I, I, I see they're all very sharp, and I want to turn to them pretty quickly. But, um, you know, I recognize the fact that, to a certain extent, that the framing of this event is backwards, and that's on me. Um, we're looking at, at this, this tool we have. You know, we have this hammer of on-site inspection, and we're looking around for nails. And that's sometimes a useful exercise. So let's, let's you know, ideally you'd want to decide, well, what do I want to limit with my treaty or what do I want to control with my treaty? What information do I want to get and, and, and provide? 
and then go from there. So there are, as you both know, a number of ideas about what sorts of things might and might not be desirable to curtail or, or control. Control is probably the better word in the context of a nuclear arms control treaty or a strategic arms control treaty. And there's also efforts, and you know, Corey, you referenced the IPNDB, um, and there's others uh, to, to figure out, well, how do we exactly do, do we do that? So can both of you give me um, something like a, a tour of the horizon of these are the things that we might consider limiting or curtailing or controlling in a future arms control treaty. Um, you know, your uh, report that came out recently with George Perkovich, Perne talks about the desirability of potential potential yield limitations. Um, that's one one possibility. There are strategic rel strategically relevant non nuclear capabilities that might be worth limiting. Um, if you can both please talk about what we might want to limit and why, and then what role of any on-site inspection might have in that process. Corey or, or uh, Brene? Yeah, I'll start this time. Um, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, a report, you know, proportionate deterrence a model nuclear posture review that George Perkovich and I recently released. Uh, you know, James Acton, um, uh, Timothy, um, uh, T.D. McDonnell and myself also released a, a recent arms control report at Carnegie. It's been a busy uh, winter for us. And um, and I won't talk too much about fuel cycle issues. I think um, I would stumble over myself very quickly. I know Corey can touch on it, but one of the um, proposals we, we discussed for uh, a U.S.-China potential agreement is to look at uh, fissile material cutoffs with, between the two countries. I think there's uh, a lot of reasons why that would be difficult to negotiate, but um, compared to negotiating arms control with the Chinese in any other area, it seems like it's just, you know, kind of par for the course. Um, as a general matter, I think, you know, as you mentioned, uh, nuclear capable or dual use systems um, are going to become more of a concern. Um, I think, you know, to show my bias, at least, I think something like New START um, should exist in perpetuity, um, you know, sort of setting aside uh, political factors that then and sort of uh, developments in other nuclear armed countries. Um, if the status quo is largely maintained in some sort of realm of, um, you know, uh, uh, where the numbers are today between the United States and Russia and, and with China's modernization ongoing, something like New START with on site inspections that deals with strategic delivery systems should continue to be in force for um, the foreseeable future. Um, so even after a five year extension, if New START was replaced, I think limits on those big three types of systems, ICBMs, SLBMs, and bombers, should continue to be enforced. And by and large, on site inspections coupled with, um, you know, increasing NTM capabilities, especially when it comes to um, overhead imagery, um, seem to work for that verification and monitoring mission. Now, as you move to dual use systems, you know, the INF treaty dealt with dual use missiles in a pretty simple way. It just said, missiles in this range band that are ground launched can no longer exist. And it was supposed to last forever. Obviously that didn't work out as um, you know, Russia's uh, security environment changed from their own estimation and they violated the treaty. Now, something that would um, be a really difficult verification challenge would be kind of an INF Treaty 2.0 where you need to verify whether, um, and there've been proposals out there, make it a true INF, make it all about banning nuclear systems but allowing conventional systems. Now that would be really difficult because we're talking about smaller items of accountability and verifying the absence of nuclear warheads on what were formerly dual use systems. And so um, it would, it, versions of existing um, strategic arms control on-site inspections would work, but I would imagine the number of inspections, the amount of intrusiveness would increase if you're relying solely on on-site inspections. And, I don't really have a good head for exactly where NTM can come in to help replace that mission because it is ultimately about missiles that are based somewhat close to areas where a conflict could, or crisis could erupt, um, um, you know, at least in a believable way. Um, I think as you move toward uh, warhead counting, um, that's where things get a lot more difficult. And I think that that's sort of the, the sort of future of strategic arms control that um, people have been really focused on. And I guess another plug for, for Corey's work with IPNDV, I think it's really remarkable that 
this collaboration has continued even in the past five years or four years of the Trump administration. And a lot of credit is due to NTI and the State Department for making it happen. I mean, that's the type of work that needs to be ongoing um, because as we know, um, as we think of new and interesting ways to, tr new and interesting tools to use to help verify agreements, um, all the parties in that agreement have to trust that those capabilities are designed for inspections and nothing more and are willing to trust the results they get from those. And that, again, goes back to the diplomats to make sure that's the case. Thanks, Brene. Corey, I'm going to turn it over to you. We have um, uh, a number of, of thoughts on what might be limited, what might be desirable to limit or control in a future arms control agreement. Uh, what can you talk, what can you tell us about what might be possible uh, including based on work being done by IPNDB and others. Yeah, I think there are a number of things, and I just want to add uh, add to Pranay's list, which I agree with completely that those are the areas that we're going to need to focus on in the future. Um, I think an interesting concept that came up, uh, you know, one could argue about the credibility of the diplomatic dialogue that resulted in it, but this idea of no increase is also a different issue. Because when we start talking about total numbers of anything as opposed to um, subsets, but if we're thinking about total numbers of warheads, total numbers of weapons, um, that does add in some interesting issues. In, in particular, um, you have to start establishing confidence at, of a, in a baseline declaration at that point. You have to understand what that total is and have confidence that that number is the complete number. Um, this is actually an area that IPNDV did a lot of, has done a lot of work on, on verifying baselines um, and initial declarations and things like that. So there's quite a lot of, um, of work, but that, that has come out of the partnership on that, which I think is quite interesting and, and could become relevant if total numbers um, become, uh, part of treaty discussions. But this idea of no increase brings in two things. I mean, um, at, at NTI and in some of our conversations, we talk about this as the bathtub analogy, right? If you're, if you're verifying this uh, dismantlement, you're, you're basically confirming what's going out of the drain on the bottom, but you also have to make sure the tap is turned off. Um, and so this does bring in some of these fissile material production issues, potentially, uh, that, that Prene mentioned on fissile material cutoff, um, either internationally or, or bi or multilaterally. Um, you start to you start to connect to the international um, nuclear safeguard system, the international verification that is already out there for non-nuclear weapon states um, that have you know have monitoring of their fissile material um, production and um, technologies and inventories or facilities and inventories. Um, and so, what I think is interesting about this, and the reason that I wanted to bring it up, is I do think what what we might see in the future is this connectivity between and among a lot of these different issues. And as, as Pranay said, we, there are, there's a way to think of this as all part of one big world. And then there are ways to break, break it apart into distinct and different tasks. And you know, politically or diplomatically, it might be seen as an easier task to address each, um, each of these pieces separately. But from a verification and particularly from a technology and systems perspective, that's, that makes less sense because if you're you know you can't have an entire regime to verify a certain type of of um of weapon that's oh by the way it's it's um co-located with these other types that are being verified by a completely different regime are you sending multiple teams into the same site at different times you know so all of these things really start to become connected and the i the point at which we start to think about strategic, uh, not just not strategic in the sense of strategic arms, but a strategic ar approach to arms control. Um, I think that's going to be that's going to kind of change the diplomatic, but also the technical tasks that are in front of us. And, and, and I hope that um, IPNDB is contributing to that a little bit in the sense that we are bringing in non uh, weapons possessors, as well as those who possess nuclear weapons and others to say, we all have to have a stake in this, let's figure out how we all build confidence, and also use, frankly, the good both technical and policy contribution of people who have been excluded from the rooms in the past. You know, that's there are a lot of good ideas out there and, and we, we need all of them right now. So let's get as many good voices as possible. Um, so I guess I would just conclude by saying, I think that as opposed to saying, here is the exact answer, I think what we need to do is create a space. And in the United States, we need to create and empower an interagency process that fosters and facilitates this space for um, innovation. And that's both technology innovation, you know, things that are going on at the national labs, et cetera, but also policy and, and diplomatic innovation. Um, 
we need to pair that with, with efficiency. Uh, the more obligations we define for ourselves, and especially when we look at on-site inspection, um, we don't have an unlimited pool of time, people, and frankly, patients <laughs> of our adversaries. Um, so we need to look for efficiencies. We need to think about transparency as a bounding principle of some of these activities because of this confidence we have to build in the rest of the world um, and with our counterparts. And we have to think about communication and messaging, not as how, you know, how do we write the press release around this, but how do the activities that we're, we are conducting as a state and participating in as part of an on-site inspection regime, how is that, that telling the story of our strategic posture and our strategic decision-making? Um, so I do think that all of these things will come into play and that's why this interdisciplinary and kind of multi-party um, effort and in my mind that really drives an, an, an interagency um, interdisciplinary process for the United States will be so important in defining both our verification objectives but how we're gonna meet them. That sounds enormously sensible as well as enormously challenging. So thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm going to turn to uh, some of the questions that we have and try to, um, to get to as many of them as I can. First up, um, right out the gate, and, um, and thank you uh, in the background for Madison for, um, for helping me quarterback these um, because my attention is limited. Um, from Hiroaki Nakanishi, uh, we have, how can we incentivize China to join an on-site inspection arrangement, whatever we might be inspecting with them warheads, ballistic missiles, um, dual use missiles, and so on and so forth. Um, what lessons, if any, that we've learned from New START, INF, and other OSI treaties uh, with Russia can be applied or utilized to China? That, that's a, a sharp question. And I wonder whether lessons from the US Russia relationship really do apply to the US China relationship, or whether we have this special path dependency with Russia that. Um, the, the sort of the, the lessons we've learned, the agreements we've come to with them may, if we try to apply them to China, they may shape at that. I don't know. Um, thoughts? Uh, I'm happy to start um, and um, I'll keep it brief. You know, the United States and Russia benefit from um, two things in the arms control relationship. Uh, one, they viewed uh, and have viewed for the last few decades strategic arms control um, in their own benefit. So there is mutual interest in continuing a stream strategic arms reduction process. Maybe it'll morph into more of an arms limitation process um, as the numbers continue to come down. Um, the second thing they have in common um, is an excess of deployed strategic nuclear warheads and delivery systems. Um, they um, have, and, and the clearest demonstration that there was an excess is how successful strategic arms reductions have been for the last 20 to 30 years. Um, clearly, the two sides have more deployed nuclear weapons than they felt they needed to meet their own deterrence objectives and foreign policy objectives. And so, in a way, you know, the START Treaty and the New START Treaty have done some of the easy work in getting the two sides to, to try to find that happy um, low number that they can both live with. And of course, the number of weapons that we have is intimately tied to the number of weapons that Russia has. Many of our weapons are targeting theirs and vice versa. Now. The complicating factor in this is, you know, China, if it increases the size of its nuclear arsenal, if it moves to a, a more alert or, you know, a launch under attack, launch on warning stance, if it abandons no first use, all these types of things that I think the Trump administration teased as possibilities in the future, but we don't know um, whether they will happen or not, um, put them in a different heading in a different direction than the United States and Russia, who have been working to get their numbers down, who have been working to use agreements to um, do, you know, do open ocean targeting, to observe each other's ballistic missile launches, that sort of thing. And they're sort of looking for great areas where they can increase stability in the deterrence relationship, whereas with China, I mean, the trends are in different directions. So um, I think with China, as is the case with the US, we need to figure out, you know, in the Indo-Pacific region, um, what is the sort of stable, uh, what does sort of status quo look like? Um, I think status quo is, has not been reached yet between the two countries. They both feel like they need to be um, addressing mi military developments by the other with their own military deployments or, or new um, you know, R&D. And so I think an approach to China is going to require some acknowledgement that the two countries have more to gain by limiting arms racing and increasing transparency, which is sort of a hallmark of the US-Russia strategic arms control relationship, 
I don't see that that's been the case yet. And we know that transparency to China when it comes to um, military and especially nuclear systems um, would be viewed as a big concession to the United States. And um, that's why we have lots of China experts and lots of nuclear and arms control experts who are gonna be examining this problem. I wish I had a shortcut, I think. Um, the approach that we've outlined in some of our reports is it's important to start small. It's important to start with baby steps. We don't have a mature relationship with China when it comes to arms control. So we can't expect to jump into a new start or an INF type of formal treaty with China on day one. We're going to have to at least build a culture on both sides of looking to find common ground when it comes to increased transparency, mutual deterrence, those sorts of issues. Corey? Yeah. I mean, I, I think I'll, I'll just add that I, China comes up a lot, obviously, and it's obvious why we want to engage China. Um, I don't think it's obvious why we want to why we want to bring China into an existing US Russia bilateral arrangement that's been developed, designed and evolved for its own purpose. Um, and so I do think we need to take that step back, say, what is what would China's interest be in in engaging this? But again, after all, and Pranay said this very well. The U.S. engaging in arms control is not for Russia's purpose, for Russia's interest, it's for our own. So similarly, what is our interest in engaging China? Um, what would be meaningful in, um, in balancing uh, strategic objectives with um, an arms control approach? Um, and it may not look like that with, with which we are, have you know, um, engaged Russia. So I do think it kind of takes, we need to take that step backward before we can take a step forward. That being said, I think further engagement with China on a number of things related to nuclear confidence building, um, transparency, et cetera, is, is and will become you know, even more necessary. So we need to be having, we need to be taking that step backward. We need to be having that conversation. I just don't think it's gonna lead us to have something that looks like new start um, necessarily. Um, and the more that we can do that multilaterally, um, we may find some value to that as well. That's a good point. Um... I want to try and, and put together a three-parter that has elements of questions from Bill Moon, um, my CNA colleague, Anya Fink, and, uh, and Justin Anderson from NDU. Um, they all sort of center on future of US-Russia on-site inspection. Bill Moon wonders, uh, summarizing, um, any possibility of future warhead level limitations and is it possible for us to, to work on that sort of thing with the Russians, given that we've, we've had access to their warhead storage facilities in the past, including through CTR, he says. Um, one element. Anya asks, Putin has suggested support for continued um, you know, detailed verification arrangements, including a potentially on-site inspection, but has also uh, suggested resentment that um, about, for example, portal monitoring arrangements, which may, uh, according to him, exceed what is actually required for treaty verification. And related to that, um, Justin Anderson asks, what role could portal monitoring play? Um, no, the question just disappeared. What role could portal monitoring play in a um, future on-site inspection regime? And how would it be similar to or different from uh, what we've done in the past at Votkinsk. Sure, I'm happy to start um, and I'll try to take these in turn. Um, look, I, I think there is a future for um, inspecting uh, warheads at storage facilities. Um, you know, Carnegie uh, in, in a recent report we published um, talks about starting the ball rolling with the Russians on non-strategic nuclear warheads by um, starting inspections at empty war storage facilities. So these are storage facilities which used to have warheads, um, and we want to confirm that they continue to not have any warheads there. Um, that could address some, um, you know, regional deterrence concerns, like do the Russians have a storage facility on, in Kaliningrad that um, they are saying there are no warheads at, but the U.S. continues for whatever reason, intelligence information, press reports, what have you, um, thinks that there could be warheads there. A good reason to do so is you can at least take a look at these facilities and see like, even if they don't have warheads there, could they accept warheads and are they in such a condition that they could be used operationally to quickly make warheads with delivery systems, which are parked nearby. I mean, this is all good information to have as we think about um, tackling nuclear warhead 
limitations as well as an, an overall sort of warhead limit. Um, so I think it's very much possible, and I think on-site inspections have a role to play there. Um, the question is, um, would you move from a current on-site inspection regime under New Start, where you're trying to confirm the absence of warheads on delivery systems, to a regime in which you're trying to confirm numbers of warheads, which is a little bit different problem, technically is possible, but it's been the type of thing that the parties have not been comfortable with, given the amount of insight you may get by doing uh, radiation detection of actual warheads. Um, so that's a problem to sort out. And I'm, I'm sure that it's it's sort of a problem that can be sorted out if the two sides want to. Um, you know, as far as Putin's comments, and Anya has a really good question here, um, and I'll try to address this along with Justin's question. You know, um, perimeter portal continuous monitoring (PPCM) as it was known in INF and Start um, certainly could play a role moving forward. Um, I understand Russia's hesitancy on, on bringing it back. I don't necessarily think that's a, a firm line in all conditions. I think the context matters here. Um, portal monitoring was raised by Trump administration officials in this sort of six month push um, over the course of 2020 to try to figure something out before the election on New START extension, which was not just New START extension, but a pathway to a future agreement. Um, it's unclear to me whether details were exchanged, whether there was a clear purpose to doing portal monitoring, if it was tied to monitoring warheads or if it was tied to monitoring, um, you know, mobile ICBM launchers that are supposed to be non-deployed. So I think the purpose of portal monitoring has to be clarified. Um, what do you want to use it for? Um, in the, you know, INF and START days, it was used to monitor the production of new ballistic missiles and as they exit facilities. Um, I'd, I'd hazard a guess that we can do a pretty good job of monitoring that production um, through overhead imagery and other NTM um, better than we were able to in the past. And so maybe the, the need for portal monitoring for that specific purpose has diminished. But I do think portal monitoring may be um, something you want to bring into play when it comes to warheads, because warheads are much smaller. You could hide them in the back of a pickup truck and drive it off the base, you know? And so there's um, maybe there's some sort of radiation detection similar to what we do for, um, you know, port security, um, radiation detection equipment of, for vehicles to monitor whether warheads are going in and out of the facility in our future agreement. Um, in terms of, a, and the last piece of Justin's question, in terms of whether it would play sort of a different um, kind of role, I imagine you could bring remote, remote sensing into uh, portal monitoring. Uh, I think that's much more feasible today than it was a long time ago. Again, through monitoring radiation going in and out of uh, uh, you know, an operational base. Um, of course, again, portal monitoring has to be tied to the purpose. Um, it has to be tied to a purpose delineated by the treaty. And uh, obviously the two sides have to pour over any sort of remote sensing new technologies that are introduced to make sure that they fundamentally are only there to monitor, you know, warheads going in and out, if that's their purpose, as opposed to in general collecting, you know, background information or intelligence information that are not the subject of the treaty. Um, thank you for that, Pernay. Um, thank you both to Corey and Pernay for, and as well as Madison for making this event happen. I really wish we had time for one more question because there's this terrific question from uh, both an anonymous attendee as well as Anna Pacelli on um, possibilities, what emerging technologies are on the horizon that could be especially relevant for the future of arms control and on-site inspection. I know that that would be, um, I, I imagine you'd have an enormously informative answer on that, Corey, but I, I'm afraid we don't have time for it because we are at a hard noon stop. Um, I want to thank everyone for participating. I want to uh, reinforce Madison in the chat, um, engage with our speakers on, um, on Twitter, if you'd like, as well as uh, with us at CNA. Next month, we have the next, the 10th in this series of CNA st strategy and policy analysis events on small states in an era of great power competition. That'll be taking place on February 24th. Information on that is available on our website at cna.org strategy as well as by reaching out to Madison or me. Um, that has been a full and informative event. I've certainly learned a lot. Thank you very much, Corey and Perne and Madison for, for participating and making this happen. Thank you to everyone who showed up. All that remains is to thank our speakers and wish everyone a great rest of their day. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Madison. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.